Thank you very much, um, and uh, thank you for all being here, and also everywhere in the world where you will follow our video streaming. Welcome. Um, I would like to um, present here the new institute of the Dutch language. Um, and there, has been, there have been quite some changes over the last couple of years. Some of you may remember the ENL, the Dutch Institute of Lexicology, and in 2016 it was transformed into a new institute with a broader mission, the Dutch Language Institute. So not only lexicology, but the whole field of the language materials as they present themselves for the Dutch language. And First and foremost, I, I always have been looking at language also from a business point of view and an economic point of view. And then we can definitely say that Dutch is not a small language. Approximately 24 million speakers. Part of them are in Belgium, in Flanders, in the Netherlands, and also a smaller group in Suriname. Dutch is one of the 40 most spoken languages in the world, so you can say it is a large language within the smaller languages, or it is a small language within the large languages. But it is even stronger online. When we look at the digital communication, it is one of the 10 most important languages on the internet and social media. And Dutch is the eighth most used language on Twitter and the ninth language on Wikipedia. So this also says something about economic activity and the presence of Dutch in the world. Now, language as business, uh, Carola already mentioned that um, it's important to consider language as a very important aspect, a very important aspect of uh, communication in business life. So Dutch is the language of a very strong region, if you look at the business figures for the Netherlands and Flanders combined, and you can also see that .nl is one of the most well-known um, extensions for internet, and they all have Dutch on their websites, and the same holds for .be. As Carol mentioned, I wrote a book on the theme after many years of experience in this field. It's in Dutch, but by now you're convinced that Dutch is so important that you all want to study it or read it or understand it. So I might think of writing a book next year in English, but in the meantime, please try and read it because uh, you will learn a lot from it in perspective of how important it is to look at the language material also in a business perspective. I wrote a book after being um, head of um, a translation and interpreting department for many years, and I saw the changes also in the professional lives of translators and interpreters embracing digital technology, but at the same time the frustration that if a, st a young student at the age of 18 um, comes home and says, I'm going to study languages, the reaction most of the time is, oh my God, can't you do something better? I mean, go and go for a law degree or study economy or become an engineer. What in God's earth are you going to do with languages? but we need good linguists who embrace technology, and they are hard to find. So the importance of a digital language infrastructure is quite important. And for this strong Dutch-speaking region, we need all the kind of digital language infrastructure, the language data, and all the tools that we can have at our disposal. This was also a lesson learned from Metanet. Many of you know the publications. The Metanet Consortium studied the state of the art of the digital status of a language. How much material is available in a digital format? Some languages are really underdeveloped, and so you cannot prepare the right tools for them to be part of this new digital revolution. And here you can see on this slide from metanet.eu that language technology is very important, not only for the large languages, but especially in Europe today, because due to our multilingualism, we have fairly small countries, but the multilingual market also turns into a single digital market, and you need technology to overcome these gaps in communication. 
and languages that do not invest in these new technologies and development, they will be left behind. So Metanet clearly says, for Dutch, it's not bad, but information technology changes our everyday lives. Computers are used for everything these days, writing, editing, calculating, information retrieval, reading, listening to music. Many people don't use any other appliances. They do everything through their digital portal, which gives them access to so many things. And we have our smartphones. Uh, imagine the time when we didn't have a smartphone. I, I think it was really wonderful those days, but anyhow. Now we have phone calls, emails, everything at hand. We get the information on the spot whenever we want it. But, okay, it's there. So, how does this massive digitization and how does the change in digital information, knowledge and everyday communication, how does it affect our language? The status of a language is not only uh, measured by the numbers of speakers or by the number of books, films and TV stations that a language uses. No, it's also the presence of that language in the digital information space and the software applications. And thanks to a joint initiative of both the Flemish government and the Dutch government some years ago, we had a very large-scale research program for digital language materials for Dutch. It was called the Stevin Call. It was wonderful because it brought together researchers, computational linguists, language technologists, linguists, both from the south and the north. They got to know each other better. And the philosophy behind it is that it would be really stupid to waste research money if, uh, let's say, computational linguistics in Groningen was developing something and the same tool was at the same time being developed in Ghent or in Leuven. Why not join forces? The Stiving program allowed us to consolidate the Dutch language for modern communication and information society. This was one of the explicit goals. And indeed, the results of Metanet, of their report, confirmed it. Dutch is not doing that bad for the language resources and the digital resources we have. Dutch plays in the same league as German and French, with a lot of more mother tongue speakers, but we obviously, everybody is still lagging behind English. The results of the Stevin call, they, are being, they have been published in the uh, booklet uh, Essential Speech and Language Technology for Dutch, and you can see that uh, the results are there on the joint research and development um, uh, efforts in the low countries in human language technology. And it was really great because many, many things have been realized, both in corpus collection, in lexicology, in tools, um, in parsing technology, speech recognition, machine translation, and so on. And it's important that languages keep up with these new standards. Obviously, it's not finished. On the contrary, the Stevin call stopped and ended, and there is huge need for more research money, and we are confronted with new challenges. If we compare the very beginning of the Stevin call, let's say around the year 2003, with now, already, there are big changes again in information technology. The next generation of information technology is coming, and will master human language to such an extent that human users will be able to communicate using technology in their own language, hopefully, if every language can provide the data and the tools. Data retrieval devices will be much more powerful, and there will be very special support for translators and interpreters. They won't become um, excluded, on the contrary, but they have a linguistic technology at their hands that helps them to speed up the boring work so that they can concentrate on the more interesting parts of their job. And then a new challenge, and we will learn more about that in, during the conference, is the new techniques used in computer-assisted language learning. Computer-assisted language learning has been there for a long time, but now there is a whole new boost into new methods and new methodology using NLP and using lots of new technology in order to enhance 
the use of language technology for language learners. And especially in our society today, with lots of migration, we have an enormous amount of learners of, in this case, Dutch as a second language, but it happens everywhere in Europe. So you need also to help these people with made-to-measure computer-assisted language learning tools. Language technology will help to address complex issues relating to multilingualism in Europe. I already mentioned the fact that we have one single digital market, but we are at the same time, let's say, um, sometimes not connected due to the multilingualism. If people don't understand each other, there is a bridge to gap in language. So language technology can help. It will provide benchmarks for our global partners and it can be seen as a kind of form of assistive technology that helps overcome all these so-called disabilities of language diversity. How can we communicate with languages we don't master? Now, it's interesting to see in every slide I came across or every uh, report I came across, across in the evolution of industry, we are now in the industry 4.0, where a new trend is being yeah, developed and the trend now is cyber systems, the internet of things and new networking. Brilliant. And if we read more about the industry, I will here focus on a couple of aspects. Just computers and automation will come together in an entirely new way. And robotics connected remotely to computer systems. They will be equipped with machine learning algorithms. And again, they can learn and control the robotics with a little input from human beings. But there still needs to be communication. Industry 4.0 introduces what has been called the smart factory, with lots of processes where physic cyber physical systems will monitor all the other activities going on in the factory. But again, there has to be communication and cooperation with humans in real time. And this continues. What do we need for Industry 4.0? Okay, we find a lot of interesting things. Interoperability. Machines and devices, they have to be able to connect and communicate with people. We need information transparency. You need to be able to contextualize information. We need technical assistance, both the ability of a system to support humans in making decisions and solving problems. And we need decentralized decision making for simple decisions that a machine can make without in fact, consulting a human being and becoming autonomous. It's all great, but in almost every of these aspects, I read words like communication, contextualizing information. So what is missing in all of these reports is, what about language? They all forgot about that. Engineers are developing smart systems. IT people, they develop all kinds of tools. But what about language? What about linguistic data? People seem to forget that the communication will be in the mother tongue of the human being or the operator being present there in the factory. I've um, cited many examples in my book on how large companies got away from their monolingual approach in English in order to address the people on the work floor in their own mother tongue. So we need linguistic data, we need support for all languages, and we need a lot of language and speech applications. And that is missing very often in the discourse about this new industry. And there is a big challenge here. So we now called it the language industry 4.0. Where are we? And I would like to invite you all. Next year, we have a large conference in Breda on the 9th and 10th of March. And the title is The Language Industry 4.0, Embracing the Future. Where are we? Are we ready for all these challenges in language industry? Two aspects are clear to all of us. The massive growth of the computer power and processing time, so the hardware and the microprocessors have changed enormously. 
leaving us with very powerful computers, and we have big data. Basically, we have almost too many data. But how to make them available hmm, to the people who need them in the way they want it? So, and that's where our institute, the Dutch Language Institute, comes in as, let's say, the keeper and the, the, yeah, the organization that is the central hub for the Dutch-speaking world. We are the developers, keepers, and also distributors of sustainable language resources. This is really important because when data are left, when a project finishes at university, very often it stays on a server somewhere but is forgotten later on. So we can host the data, we can upgrade them, we can make them available and keep them available. We are responsible for creating, archiving and maintaining Dutch corpora, but also the lexica, the dictionaries and grammars, and we provide the necessary building blocks for the Dutch language and the development of very interesting tools. The language material, if you go to our website, then you will see that we have an enormous amount of data for dictionaries, uh, computational lexica, corpora and tools. Most of our dictionaries, or all, all of them, are open access and available online. And the software and many computational tools, they are open access. For some products, you need to go through the Clarion site. As a researcher, you can access the data if you log in into the Clarion portal. And, of course, we also have results from different European projects we were involved in, but also those can be consulted on the related project pages. The ENL, the Dutch Institute of Lexicology, became famous with their large dictionaries. In those days, of course, written on paper. Everything has been retro-digitized and is available in digital format, which is wonderful. And you can go through search procedures to look into all these dictionaries. We have a very strong component and expertise in historical Dutch, but also we work on the largest dictionary for the contemporary Dutch. And this is purely on a digital basis. With the lot, a lot of information, it's really wonderful, but it will continue to be enriched through computational linguistic technology, and it will be a very powerful tool where people can search almost everything in relation to the modern Dutch language. We also have a lot of information on neologisms. We monitor the evolution of Dutch, and we also uh, make an inventory of new words that come into the language so that we can really monitor from year to year what is going on and what changes are made in the language. Quite new is that we are building a collocations dictionary. It doesn't exist for Dutch. It's important because we can both use it for the general Dutch modern dictionary, but we can also use it in computational um, assisted language learning tools, because if you have collocations for Dutch, people who learn Dutch will get more information upon the phraseology for Dutch. And last week, uh, our first bilingual dictionary was put online. It is a dictionary for New Greek, Dutch New Greek, and so we will have more and more of these dictionaries between Dutch and a smaller language that will become available through our website. It doesn't stop here because this is, let's say, the more traditional part that was already there in the Institute, but we now embrace everything that has to do with language variation. So also the dialects, the dictionary of Flemish dialects and linking through uh, linking three large dialect dictionaries hmm, is one of our new projects, together with the University of Ghent and with the University of Nijmegen. We have lots of lexical information and corpora available, lexica for different types of use, a lexical database for Dutch with semantic relations, we have other databases with multi-word expressions, databases with single words and multi-word expressions, we have a reference corpus for Dutch, and so on. So lots and lots of material. We're also quite proud to host Taalportaal, which is a huge database and a website where you can find everything on the linguistic structure of Dutch, of Frisian, and of Afrikaans. It's a sister language of Dutch. 
So here, the whole morphology, phonology, syntax of Dutch is described. We are now in the process of talking to the Institut für Deutsche Sprache in Mannheim because they have a similar project, Grammis, and they would like to link it to ours. So we'll see about that for the future. Plenty of new responsibilities. Uh, in 1997, the dictionary, sorry, the um, general uh, grammar for Dutch has been written. It was first published as a book in print. Now it is a digital version, but it needs improving. So the new grammar for Dutch, ANS, the Algemene Nederlandse Spraakkunst, the Dutch grammar, will be completely, let's say, re yeah, reformed into a very interesting digital format that is very much searchable for everybody who wants to know something about the grammar in Dutch. Interesting enough, when this project is finished, then we might try to link the grammatical information to the dictionaries available. So it opens new perspectives. And of course, language variation goes further, not only standard language and general language, but also the specialized language is interesting for us. So we have um, a new task becoming the expert center for terminology work. And so we will look into different collections of language for special purposes, such as the medical field and the legal field. And we will try also to host them on our website. The first collection that is going to be available next year is a legal dictionary for Dutch, the legal system in the Netherlands, not in Belgium, the Dutch system and the Spanish system. And then we are part in a project for EU uh, terminology. So as you know, all know, Dutch, French, Italian and German were the first languages when the first, let's say, the first uh, start of the European Union, what was going to become the European Union, they were the four languages that were there. So Dutch has been in the EU terminology and the databases from the very beginning. But still we need updates and we need more and more information. And we provide it through a project for the Termrat Academy. It's a terminology council that connects us, the Dutch Language Institute, with students working in the field in translation and terminology and then the EU terminologists. So just to keep the language up to date also in the EU databases. So plenty of work there as well, and it's fascinating to see how languages evolve in creating new terminology for specific fields. Most of you know, because yesterday we had our very successful uh, final meeting of the European network of e-lexicography. This was a cost network. Many of you were there yesterday already. And this is a very successful project where we have building stones for new project work. So Elexis, for example, is a result of what we did in this cost network. But in the meantime, the Dutch Language Institute is a member of a new cost network. And this is the European network for combining language learning. So it's about computer assisted language learning and crowdsourcing techniques. Interesting because from corpus research and from um, building new corpora, you can also feed these data into computer assisted language learning. This project only started in March. We are not a grant holder, but we are uh, very active in one of the work packages and it will give us ample opportunity to learn a lot about new technology available for computer assisted language learning. And we also work in other projects such as Nederlop, which is a Dutch research project on historical texts and on, we start now a new project on the mental lexicon. A project that was um, part of the ENL work a long time ago was the IMPACT project. It was in fact organized by a number of very prominent libraries, among others the Virtual Library of Cervantes in Madrid, but also the Royal Libraries of um, Paris, the British National Library, the Royal Library here in The Hague, and the idea was to help librarians especially, but all researchers, to digitize historical texts. 
people who are not familiar with these technologies, they may think, oh, my work in historical literature or in histo history as such cannot be digitized, so I cannot use these new techniques. It's not true, it is there, but you have to become aware of what is going on. So the result of this project gave such a wonderful computational tools in OCR and new reading technology for old material that we continued to um, reform this into a center. And it is called the Center for Digitization. You can find all the information on the website, digitization.eu. And also researchers can find there up to 250 tools into all kinds of material for OCR and technology to help access, digital access, to historical texts that were only available in print. Uh, hopefully, at the end of this year, Katrin, I'm looking at you, we will have a webinar on this so that we can also help researchers worldwide to train them into this new technology. And then, all the output from this wonderful Steven research projects, they are hosted at our institute. So all the results were brought together in what we call the TST Centrale, the Language and Speech Technology Central. You can say, well, it's like a, it's like a web shop where you can find all the results. And you can go to our website and then you will find the link to TSC Centrale and there you can see all the language materials that we host. It's a huge catalogue of digital materials. This is the old site and it looks a bit old-fashioned. It uh, was the way it was built when the Stevin project just, was just finished. But now I have a preview and even for the people from uh, the Dutch Language Institute, it's new, because yesterday I talked to the webmaster and he agreed on providing a number of slides. So this is going to be, more or less, the new webshop. We thought it's crazy to have uh, um, digital language materials, on the one hand from our own institute, then from this TST webshop, and then from Clarin, why not bring it all together? So in the new system, on the right-hand side, you have filters and you can choose a number of tags in order to find language materials. You can all go through the catalog yourself, but if you choose a number of tags, for example here, part of speech and semantics, then immediately the system will answer with all the data available. So if you are looking, for example, for a corpus on phonetics, then you just click on these two tags and the system will give you everything available in our webshop. So this is the first tryout of what the new webshop is going to be. We still are going to talk about it in the Institute and then with other partners. But this is, let's say, the improved version. If then you want to know more about a particular lexicon, such as this one, you immediately get all the details. You get a very easy way of downloading the material after you agree with the, uh, let's say, the conditions for download. So it's much easier than it used to be. And this is what we want to continue doing. So once you said yes, I agree, then you can uh, download the material or you can log in uh, with your own login and you can have a look at the different data. So it's important that we make this access as easy as possible for everybody. Most of the language materials we have are free, definitely for research, for students, for anybody who is just consulting them. Only for companies, they will have to pay depending on what they need and if they are going to build a commercial product with it. Okay, finally, I'm not sure about the time, still okay, yeah. Uh, I want to say a couple of words on the uh, Dutch Language Institute as a Clarin Centre. Most of you know what a Clarin Centre is, but still, just for clarification, you know that in 2008 uh, the Common Language Research Infrastructure was created for Europe and that the Netherlands were quite strong and active in there from the very beginning. So this then, later on, the whole network developed into a Clarin ERIC, European Research Infrastructure Consortium, and it became stronger and stronger. Again, it is there to share information 
and to learn from each other, like good practices. What are we doing here? What can you learn? Somebody else in Greece or in, in Czechia may have developed something wonderful, and you can learn from each other. At the very moment right now, there is the Clarin Conference in Budapest, unfortunately at the same time with our ELEX conference. But, um, well, one of our um, staff members is there, and again, good practices will be exchanged and we will learn more. So it's quite interesting that um, you, need, well, you need a Clarion Centre also to support the researchers. So basically, we can help them when they want to deposit their tools or their data once they finished a project. We take care as a Clarion Centre of the digital sustainability. We will keep it updated, it will be made available, there will be a backup and so on. So it is, um, the, the researcher can be sure that the data and tools will be kept alive and that there is an easy retrievability through a portal site. We can only do that if we use the right metadata. And in order to become a Clarion Centre, you need to pass the test, so to speak, in order to get a data seal of approval that you really work with the right metadata and that you use the right standards in order to protect all the information that you will make available. So the data and tools can be used online or can be downloaded with a single sign-in. Everybody who is a researcher and who has a university email and password can log in and get the data available. And it is quite important that uh, the Clarion centres are also trained to be up to date in relation to IPR, privacy and all the rules regulating the, the availability of language material. There are different types of Clarion centres. Uh, the backbone consists of the Clarion B centres and the Dutch Language Institute is one of them. And you have more, you can have more or less in one country but you have to go through an assessment procedure and as I already told you, you then get a data seal of approval because you use the right technology and the right methodology. So this is quite important. For the Netherlands, um, as I said, the Netherlands were quite strong from the very beginning in these activities around Clarin and the former ENL, now ENT, is, was the first Clarin Centre in the Netherlands to get the approval. And then uh, three other institutes followed, Meertens in Amsterdam and Huygens also in Amsterdam and the Max Planck Institute. So we have four. Apart from these centres, we also have data providers. For example, the Royal Library in The Hague or the DBNL, uh, which uh, collects all the data from Dutch literature. And then Sound and Vision, Bild and Geluid, Sound and Vision, they, uh, in fact, they uh, provide data for us to use in this context. In Flanders, however, due to the complex political structure in Belgium, there is no specific Clarin Centre, and so the Dutch Institute of Language, our institute, um, is appointed as the Clarin Centre to support researchers in Flanders. We, are, we also get the money for that from the Ministry in Flanders. So we help researchers, both at the universities in Ghent, in Leuven, in Antwerp and so on. In, we support them, we give them workshops, we train them and we help them wherever we can. Finally, a couple of more of our activities. Uh, Claria is a Dutch research programme, doesn't exist in Flanders at the moment. It's short for Common Lab Research Infrastructure for Arts and Humanities. And this is, in fact, the startup, as you say, it's humanities. So it is the startup of the digital humanities world. And in this Claria program, which is supported by the Dutch Science Foundation, there are five work packages, and we are working in two of them, on the infrastructure, the technical infrastructure, and on the linguistic content. And some of the examples of projects we do here, we optimize search engines. We have our own Black Lab engine, which is very useful for search through particular collections of data. And we have auto search. Now we can improve them and we will build a new version next year. 
We can also combine search engines from different partners, because obviously we work together with other stakeholders, such as Meertens, such as um, the University of Utrecht and others, and so we can share our data and try to make our tools, um, let's say, work together. We are working on a project called Clever, research on performance, availability and costs of these tools, and we are working on a historic um, research project, Diachronic Semantic Lexicon of Dutch. So plenty of research there. And a couple of months ago, we applied for a new Clarin Plus program. We are not sure whether it will be granted, but it is quite interesting to move on and to build on the experience we already had. What about Flanders then? Well, in Flanders, as I said, there is no Claria call at the moment, although the Ministry of Economy, Science and Innovation is thinking about it. But we have Daria. Daria is the digital research infrastructure, again, for the arts and humanities. So basically here we open up to everybody working as a digital humanist. Yesterday we already had an interesting discussion. What about a humanist? Is it a digital humanist or not? But anyhow, the research will be digital. Whether you are um, in uh, arts, in art history, in, uh, um, yeah, in, in literature, whatever, you will need digital tools. And so Daria in Flanders is now building their own virtual research environment, service infrastructure, with support from the ministry, and we d design the future the digital, for digital humanities in Flanders. It's a very interesting project. We are part of it, um, the Dutch Language Institute, and it will give us a lot of new opportunities to cooperate for digital humanities, because at the moment, digital humanities is still quite a vague concept as such. Hmm? What are we going to do in there? How can we help researchers with very, very different points of view, because formally we have to admit the focus was on linguistic research. And the linguists were either in technology or in computational techniques, but the others were more or less left out. This is our Clarion portal, and you can see the data seal of approval, all the tools, also this portal will be made, let's say, more attractive and more yeah, interesting later on because it fits then into our new website. So I've come to my conclusion, and if you go to our website, then you will find an enormous wealth of language materials. I think due to the reorganization, we are a strong institute with a very clear mission, a new mission, not only lexicology, but going for the whole of the language aspects of Dutch, we work both on a national level for the Netherlands and Flanders, but also on an international level, and definitely projects such as the cost networks, they help us a lot in finding the right partners abroad. And we want to continue this networking with academic partners all over Europe. We, on the one hand, are very much involved in scientific projects together with other academic partners, universities, research institutes, but we also have a mission to serve the community and to help everybody who works with Dutch, who is interested in Dutch, to help them and to give them all the material they need for further work. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Frida. Um, I think we've got plenty of time for questions, so are there any questions? Um, thank you very much. I'm wondering, you know, that, that it, it was a wonderful talk and all inspiring and very depressing for those <laughs> oh of us for those of us who come from under-resourced languages. And uh, there was a very interesting point yesterday at, at our annual panel when Audrun said that maybe we should also think about standard, uh, you know, pol at the level of policy or standardizing uh, what it means that one language is well described in terms of resources. And I just wanted to ask you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is there a role for standardizing um, language description by, or, or providing best, you know, not just in, in MetaNet you just listed what, 
what each language has. But is there a role for policy or a standardization body to say a well-described language digitally should mm. have A, B, C, D? And would that help maybe in yeah. for those well, languages? On the one hand, um, I agree, uh, if you look at the Metanet reports for all the European languages, it is depressing. For many languages, there isn't enough. But the, the Metanet reports for each language, they were written with the idea, if we have our public officials, the ministries, the research, the, 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 those responsible for the funding, if they read it, perhaps it was like a wake-up call, and they might try and give more money to universities who build language and speech technology. I remember last year in Antwerp, in my faculty, we had a translation technology summer school for five days, very intensive for professionals, and we showed um, automatic speech recognition for translators. And it works perfectly well for Dutch, thanks to the fact that we have a long-standing tradition in speech technology, and so um, translators in the Dutch area, where you translate into Dutch, they say we can even augment our, our profits um, up to three times because it goes so fast once you start using automatic speech recognition and not only typing um, with a keyboard. And there were Polish translators in the room and they were really, what? Why, why don't we have this? Yeah, why don't you have it? Because apparently, Poland is a very large country, but still you need a partner in language technology who wants to develop this. So it is feasible, but the Metanet reports, they were supposed to be a wake-up call for, on the one hand, for uh, local governments and national governments to pick this up and say we need to invest more. And that's also why I started my talk by saying that it's all very nice to talk about Industry 4.0, but we forget that we need language for that. Language in the, really, the, the, uh, the, the natural language, the mother tongue of all the speakers. Otherwise, people will be left behind. Now, um, the, um, the idea is also that Europe can help here, because the European Commission wants as many language materials for every official language as they can have. So we even, we prepare a corpus of parliamentary Dutch, so from the Dutch Parliament, and once it is annotated, we give it to the Commission, because they want as many data as possible in order to improve machine translation, the translation technology workbenches, and if Dutch is very well um, supplied with lots of information, then the translators who translate into Dutch will perform better. People who don't have these tools, they, indeed, the translators will be uncomfortable and they will want more, more data. So I think Europe can do a lot here. And then there is also the Charter on Regional and Minority Languages. They are recognized by the European Commission and also there um, I think about our friends in, in Wales and, and um, in other small regions. They have very strong impetus in some cases from their local governments to develop databases and to develop tools. So it's a mixture of what can be done. I'm sorry if it was depressing. I didn't mean it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's another question from Bolet. Is that can you? Yeah. Thank you for your nice talk. Uh, my question is actually very close to the previous question. I think we really need a new block, a new basic uh, language resource kit. Uh, we need to know what are the, the needs, because they have yep. changed quite a lot since we made the block uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we're continuously asked uh, by uh, politicians and, and so forth, what will it cost? What do we need? And I think we should maybe go together and try and make new calculations regarding yeah. what are the, the actual mm -hmm. needs, the sizes, uh, what does it cost to produce uh, these resources. That would be really helpful to a lot of us, I, I believe. Yes, I fully agree on that. It's not, it's, uh, to come back to your question, Thomas, it's not about creating a standard, but indeed a list of um, whatever uh, is needed for languages as a minimal toolkit, uh, what, what you need to have. And uh, that would be great. In my book, I, for example, present uh, Jibigo. Does anybody know Jibigo? It's an amazing tool. It is created by um, 
yeah, a professor who works, uh, it's a German professor, he also works at MIT, and Jibigo is a translation tool you can use using your smartphone and just also through Facebook. It's wonderful, and I was so amazed when I saw it, because it can also be used, let's say, in, in Africa, where uh, many people in, uh, let's say, countries that still need a lot of support and development, um, they, they don't, they step over the step of computers, they immediately go to smartphones hmm, to have applications, which is more feasible for them. And Jibigo works on that. But you need, uh, I, I, Dutch is not in there. They did it for German, for English, and they will do it for some other languages. And I asked them, what would it cost to do it for Dutch? It's one million euro investment. It's obviously not something we can handle, but if it's a target for a country to have it and to help people, you can, you can do it. So it's, it's indeed about money, but it's also about, as uh, Bolet also asked, it's about priorities and about what then is a minimal toolkit. And we could indeed uh, yeah, work on that and, and try to come to an agreement. Are there more questions? Uh, it, it's more of a comment than a question, but uh, I think this is a really important part, both Toma and Bolete um, <clears throat> emphasized it, and I think we have a perfect uh, forum to create something like a new Blark, which is Alexis. And in fact, I think that your institute will be responsible for that anyway, because you have that oh work package. <laughs> <laughs> more work, <laughs> right. Um, just uh, <coughs> uh, one thing more, um, it's, I'm really happy that we have this discussion at ELEX conference, uh, because this is the discussion that I used to hear at NLP or computational linguistics conferences. Mm -hmm. And I think that this trend should continue. Yes, uh, I, I fully agree, and I'm, I'm also very, very grateful that the, uh, first of all, the e-lexicography project was so successful that now we have a large network of people who know each other, who can cooperate, who can work together, and this will continue in e-lexis. So um, it, it would be a wonderful idea to, to build such a, let's say, call it a standard or call it guidelines for a, a linguistic toolkit for languages. Because I'm afraid that the Metanet reports, they are great, but perhaps the um, yeah, politicians don't read it or they you know, just don't make use of it. So. More questions? Thank you for your talk. Uh, you have put some emphasis on the academic networking and I was wondering if you could elaborate about networking with the industry yes. and more about mm -hmm. language as a business, about those factors. Yes, absolutely. It's really important also that um, um, business life can, can benefit from the developments in uh, academia, but also that academia can learn from business what is really necessary, what is needed. And um, the Dutch Language Institute is now a member of a a regional network here in the Netherlands called NOTAS. And NOTAS is a network of language technology companies. Hmm? The, all those who either develop tools or who use data, digital language data, in order to provide new, um, new applications. In my book I've also written about um, uh, companies like Bartolomeus in the Netherlands. They develop tools for people with um, handicaps and they also develop tools for yeah, people who need technology to help them get around in, in, in life. A cappella is the same. They are in urgent need of digital language materials in order, for example, to have speech technology help people um, who are limited in their capacities to, to, get a no to lead a normal life. Uh, NOTAS is important as a network 
and we will have a first meeting of NOTAS in our institute in Leiden here um, on the 13th of October. And we will also see how we can share information, what we can mean for the, the industry, industrial partners, and what they can do for us. Yeah. And in Flanders, there is no equivalent, but there you have for each province innovation centers, where also companies get together, companies that create highly innovative products and who need language technology for that, and we also are in contact with those. But I fully agree. Um, there is this, let's say, reciprocity and data exchange from both parts. More questions? Do we have any questions from the live stream? No, people have not woken up yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh. I have questions about Africans, uh, and at one of your slides uh, you had a tab for Africans as a yes. sister language. Are the tools developed for Dutch uh, applicable to Africans, or do they have any any variant for Africans? Because yeah, as far as I know, there mm -hmm. are not many resources available for Africans as such. Well, uh, for Afrikaans, it is not that bad in the sense that, for example, universities such as what is now called Northwest University, uh, which uh, most of you know as Potjesstroom, the campus over there, is very strong on computational linguistics. There is the um, lexicology um, in uh, Stellenbosch, for example, and there always has been close cooperation. So there are a number of tools, and also in our um, web shop, you find a lot of Afrikaans dictionaries or Afrikaans with another language. So it's not that bad. Um, there is development, yeah. Anyone has another question they want to ask? No? If there are no more questions, then I think it's time for coffee. But I'd first like to thank our keynote speaker once again for her very nice lecture. Pleasure. Thank you.